Welcome to Seven Figure Entrepreneur Podcast, the number one podcast for bringing you behind the scenes with real deal online earners. No fake gurus here. And today we have Josh. Man, I totally forgot to ask you how to say your last name. <laughs> Who cares, Josh? I'm the snowman. You're the, the snowman. snowman. I the love snowman it. Snowman, Josh. Can you? You can say your last name. I don't know, man. I don't know how to say it properly. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not important. Not important. All right. All right, all right. Well, uh, yeah, man, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. You bet. That's awesome, man. So you are the man behind snow, the teeth uh, whitening stuff. You guys see the ads everywhere, probably. You see Floyd Mayweather has one. Yeah, like he's, he's an influencer. Who else do you have for influencers on there? Uh, we've got hundreds of celebrities now, but the, the big A-listers, Floyd Mayweather, Chuck Liddell, Rob Gronkowski. My boy, Chuck. Uh, Universe um every housewife and bachelor and uh politicians that i can't name <laughs> uh, everyone from everybody i mean ever from d list to a list um they're on there a lot of them are uh customers huge fans a lot of them post uh organically and a couple of them approach us um wanting to be uh part of the brand most of them i would say about 95 percent of them approach us now um nice so we got to be a little bit picky, um, but we love to work with everybody. No, that's a good position to be in, man. When they're coming to you, that's way different. Yeah, that's really cool, man. So, man, before we kind of dig into like how awesome and big your company is right now, let's, uh, let's dial it back to kind of talk about like how, how you got into this space, how you sort of became an online entrepreneur and uh, yeah, where you, how you got to where you're at today. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I started about 12 years ago. So snow's, snow's going on its second full year. Um, yeah. It's still, uh, it's definitely uh, in the fastest growing of our brands. Uh, it's definitely the most talked about because of the, the, the market uh, we're in and just the celebrities and everything that we're doing. But um, it, so, so I got started about 12 years ago as a programmer um, and just learned how to learn how to web develop uh, and then uh, software, uh, software programming, software engineering, uh, all self-taught. I was 13 years old. Nice. Uh, and uh, it was just, you know, grew up in a, you know, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. Um, I'm the youngest sibling in my family. Uh, you know, wanted to want to help my family out. I knew I had to go to college. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to be. I wanted, I, I, I think at the time I still wanted to be a doctor. Um, I just wanted to, I just want to do, I, I just want to level up my family. Uh, you know, my dad is an immigrant from Spain. Left nice. Nice. Uh, an incredible career there, uh, you know, first in 400 years of family history to come to the United States all by himself and literally started over. He was making really good money, uh, still one of the most brilliant people uh, I know, and uh, left to um, put up fences for $3 an hour from Spain, a great career, to being in the Arizona 120 degree, th uh, 23 degree heat in the summer, putting up fences for $3 an hour. Damn. Uh, one up, I knew that... Uh, I Did he that. just want to be in America or what happened? You know, the thing where, uh, you know, growing up in Spain, especially in a small town, especially in Europe, um, capitalism is viewed a lot differently. Um, you know, nepotism is much more prominent. So if your dad's not a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, uh, it's very difficult for you to move up socially, especially in smaller towns. Hmm. And he recognized a lot of the, um, he recognized a lot of the uh, limitations there and wanted to make sure that, uh, that I didn't have any of those growing up, that I could uh, really live the American dream, create whatever opportunity I wanted without any ceilings being put on me. And That's so a he, huge sacrifice, man. That's awesome. Huge, huge sacrifice growing up, you know, and uh, I never struggled for anything. I, I can't stay here and be like, you know, I grew up homeless. I always had a roof over my head. I always had food to eat. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we were, you know, very humble beginnings. And uh, honestly, why I got started, I just wanted to make money. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I didn't want to be a programmer. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know anything. Yeah. All I knew was like, this is cool. Other kids are playing games. I wanted to make the games the other kids were playing. And nice. I didn't know at the time, but that was like that shift from consumer to producer, you know. And yeah. You make all and that's when you learned to program? That's when I learned to program. I was 13 years old. Gotcha. Dude, it's so interesting. I find like not a lot of programmers get marketing, but the ones that do have such a major advantage over everyone else. Oh, absolutely. 
Big time. Uh, what did what did yeah. your dad what did your dad think about your uh, your online career when you kind of started it? Because the, the, I find that like people that come from traditional like bricks and mortar business or labor or something like that over to this, they they don't really understand it. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is what happened. I so I started uh, programming because it was free, and because um, I didn't I didn't know any better. Like I think. A lot of times, the more that the older you get, the more kind of uh, risk averse you can become. And when you're mm -hmm. a kid, like anything's possible, I can do anything. You're not really afraid of anything. Yeah. And, you know, you just go into it and you're just like, um, and I started programming, started making websites for people, my own blogs, my own websites, learning about AdSense, making money online. Um, and all I could think about all night, and I, this was at the library, my family didn't even have a computer at home. So I had one hour a day that I could use my library card to use a computer. And when I was at home, uh, my mom, you know, I played football, track and field. I was in student government. So when I wasn't doing school stuff, I would watch TV and I would uh, be typing out what they were saying. So I was literally transcribing. I was just bored and I was just sitting there. And so that helped me a lot because I could type at 80 to 90 words per minute at 13 years wow. old. Wow, that's so crazy, I didn't man. Know that, that, that childhood, because we, we didn't have a computer, but my mom brought home an extra keyboard and I was just sitting there watching TV and I'm the youngest by like eight years and my closest yeah. way. So I'm just sitting there and I'm watching TV late at night. Every I'm, night. Uh, every night. And I would yeah. play games where I was like, okay, I can't look at the keyboard. And I, I was, I was just bored. And yeah. that much because as a programmer, the faster and more accurate you can type, you can literally go from brain thought, thought in your brain to a line of code without having to check anything. Go, go, go. And so for me, I had a client one day because I was making websites for like $500 a pop. Um, yeah. Like, and teachers, it was from teachers. Teachers would be like, oh, you know how to make a website? My buddy needs one. See, this so-and-so needs one. Nobody knew I made websites at the time because I didn't want to tell any of my friends because I, here I am a high school jock. You know, I'm playing sports. And it was, <laughs> it was like a geeky thing to do. Yeah. Money. And so um, one of the clients came to me. It was like, Josh you're an amazing programmer. You make websites in two days and I've never seen anything like it. I had to learn design because um, I, I had to, I had to get a bootleg version of Photoshop. <laughs> we all had those. <laughs> I was like, Oh, $500. I can't, I can't afford Photoshop. So I was like, how do I get it for free? So um, I was using Photoshop, chopping it up, programming in the back end. This was before WordPress. Shopify wasn't even a thing. So yeah. I had to, my client would be like, Hey, I want a calendar app that does this. I'm like, I guess I got to learn how to do that. Let me go on Google, how to program a calendar app. And so the client came to me, it was like, Josh, if you learn how to sell, if you learn how to market and advertise, I could pay you every single month instead of just one time to make a website. Interesting. And that was it. It was like, it was about the money. It was like, wow. You mean you so you were 15 at this time? I was 14, 15. Yeah. Yeah. And he told me that that's all you need to tell me. I was like, you'll pay me every month. I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. I was like, what do I need to learn? He's like, well, you got to learn how to drive people to the website so they can book appointments with me so they can buy cakes for me. And I was like, okay, uh, what do I do? So I read every single book I could. And the only thing I looked at all the advertising that I was on there, the only thing that was free other than word of mouth was SEO. So I was like, I don't have money. I, I can't learn how to do this stuff. So I was like, I have to be the best SEO guy on earth because yeah. I'm a kid. I have no money. So I became obsessed with SEO and, um, and started getting really, really, really good at it. Um, and uh, that was what got me started in, in marketing and advertising was like, okay, if I program my websites a certain way, Google is going to favor them more highly, which means I get more traffic, which means I get more sales. And then mm -hmm. I can pay clients $1,000 a month to do this for them because they don't know how to do it. So, um, and, and at the time being young, it still is, but being young was actually a benefit because they're like, you know, we don't know this internet stuff. You're young. We'll pay you to figure it out. And yeah. so I my benefit. So once I started racking those checks up, I finally bought a computer and was able to have internet access. You didn't even have a computer at this time? No. no. Jesus. <laughs> Where would you do all this programming then? So I was at the, so I was at the library. And yeah. After, so I would go after school because the neighborhood I grew up in was getting a little dangerous at the time. So I would hang out at the library until it closed. And, and uh, people would come after work and check their um, email real quick. And they would see me always there. Uh, so say, hey, Josh, I'm just going to check my email, print something, and you can use the rest of my hour to, to do this and that. So I was like swallowing up hours from people. <laughs> and all the kids were playing games. And I was just, I was doing whatever I had to do. And when I, 
when I didn't have a computer available to me at the library, I was reading magazines, reading books, and that's what fed me to write. I didn't even like to write at the time, but I knew that content was going to help me rank higher in Google. So I was like, I got to yeah. learn to write. And so I was like, I don't like writing. I, I didn't really even like reading, but I was yeah. like, reading and writing makes me money. I'm like, done, I'll do it. And so that's what I was doing. I love it, man. Not, not even a second thought. I don't like yeah. to do this. It's just done. Yeah. Listen, when you grow up with, you grow up with not much and you're just like, Hey, I got an opportunity to do something and, yeah. and I'm 14. Nobody wants to hire me. Nobody wants to give me a shot. The only person that gave me a shot was the internet. And, uh, <laughs> and that's the only person that believed in me was the internet. And, yeah. YouTube. and I said, look, these, they, I can do anything on the internet. They don't discriminate because of my age. They don't discriminate because I'm poor. I can do anything. I said, done. I've got to be the best at this. Dude, that's beautiful. So you built out, did you start building up your SEO clients next or what happened? So I'm, I'm quoting you on that, by the way, I'm quoting you on that. Like the, that's a great quote. The only person that gave me, a ch or the only thing that gave me a chance was the internet. That was it. You know what I, I like it. All, all I ever wanted was it was an opportunity. Like I just wanted a chance. Like that's all I wanted. Yeah. And, and I was just, just kid with all these ideas and I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I just had all this like pent up energy um, to be something. And that was around the same time when I, cause I was kind of like the class clown. Mm -hmm. uh, school was, school was a little bit easy for me um, growing up and uh, I was really good at testing. I still, am really good at standardized testing. So yeah. nice. That, that helped a lot. That was like a, a real benefit for school, but teachers you didn't have to study. Yeah. They, well, I didn't have to study as much. And they would tell me, Josh, if you would apply yourself, man, you, you know, they, I would get this every year. All the teachers would say the same thing. And I was a C student. Yeah. If you apply yourself. You'd be so, you know, straight A's. Blah, blah. And finally I was like, you know what? I was, um, I remember I was making jokes in class and like, um, you know, people stopped laughing after a while. Cause as the kids got older, they got more serious about school yeah. and I'm not funny anymore. And so I was like, you know what, what do I get out of this? Like I'm making these people laugh. I'm getting bad grades. The teachers are disappointed in me. You yeah. know, it's not going to work. So for me, I transitioned and became an A student. I ended up uh, graduating valedictorian from my high school, going uh -huh. to college, university. I finished university in two years, number one in my class straight yeah. eight, uh, from that point on, from 14 and on, never got another grade. Yeah. So, so this time, during this time, do you have like clients this whole time? Or you Making my own blogs. So, so what I did is I learned how to make my own blogs uh, and I was writing about everything because I found out about AdSense mm -hmm. and then I realized, I was like, well, how come this blog makes more money than this blog, but it gets less traffic? I didn't even know about analytics. I didn't even know how many, I didn't know anything about how many hits my website were getting. So I signed up for a website called Stat Counter. Um, and it was a free little like Google analytics wannabe yep. around. and I started to see all these people from all over the world visiting my site. I started to see, I was making five cents a click, but then on some sites I was making 50 cents a click and I was like, okay, so I'm going to start creating pregnancy blogs, health blogs. So here I am at 14 under a pen name writing about pregnancy, <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff, right? Pharmaceutical blogs, like all this stuff. And it was me writing. Uh, yeah. Every, and so I was doing that and building my AdSense, building the SEO there. And then I had the clients who were, um, who I was essentially using their money as well to learn more. And yeah. so I was going at the exact same time while I was playing varsity football, track and field, student government and getting straight A's um, and taking the city bus every morning at 5 a.m. because it would break Dude. down. And, Legit machine. Yeah. And, you know, I, once I hit it and I, I realized, I said, this is the opportunity for me to uplift my family and to really take advantage of the American opportunity. Yeah. What, I, kind of, I got a little glimpse of it. I didn't understand it much back then, but I just said, this is my chance. What a chance yeah. to be a football player, uh, NFL, a track and field all-star, um, you know, a comedian. Like I'm like the chance of me doing this and I'm already making money on it. I'm like, I'm set. Like my proudest moment was when I could go to Walmart and buy my own underwear, my own socks, my own school supplies. Yes. That was the moment. Um, it wasn't about, I didn't want cars, all this stuff. Like I knew my family couldn't buy me a car when I got my license and I was tired of being on the city bus. So I had to start selling my websites. Mm -hmm. so I could buy a car. And once I realized I could build something, rank it in SEO and then sell it. I was like, I've got a model here that I can do this with. Yeah. So I started literally manufacturing these websites. How were you at this time? 
I was still like uh, maybe 15, uh, 15 and a half. Cause I bought my first car when I was 15. Um, and I bought it all myself with a website I sold. That's amazing. Nice. No more city bus. That's, that's cool, man. So, okay. So you did this and then in college you were doing this too, right? You were doing the website stuff. I graduated from, from, uh, from high school. Um, and I knew that, you know, I'm the first in my family to graduate college. And so I knew that being the youngest, I was like, I really want to make my family proud. Uh, even though technically I didn't have to go to college, I knew that I, I wanted to do it all. So I, was yeah. like, okay. I, I showed up at Arizona State University. I applied for the honors college, got in the honors college. I'm at business school there. And, um, and I'm running my business from my dorm room and nobody knows, like still kind of like a secret. And, um, I had probably 40 freelancers that were working for me in India, Philippines, Pakistan, because I went to Google and I was like, I can't take on more clients because there's only one of me. So I was yeah. like, how to hire um, uh, people online. And I found freelancer.com, Elance. Yeah. Um, nice. Great sites. I could hire someone to help me. I'm like, nice. So I started on Skype. I learned how to train these people, screen recordings with Camtasia and all this stuff. So yeah. I was people. So when I was in college, I'm sitting there taking 24 credits a semester um, and running my business. And so I just, and the other thing was like, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. Mm -hmm. So I have to get straight A's. Um, I don't want to drop out of college. I don't want to drop out of the honors college either. Um, but I want to graduate in three years. And I ended up doing it in two years. Nice. Uh, wow. No credits at yeah. all. Uh, and so for me, it was just like more, more, more. And I remember the advisors at the college were like, like you can't, like you have to get an override for this. I was like, what do I need to sign? Who do I need to talk to? They're like, look, if you get straight A's one more semester, they'll let you do whatever you want because you can yeah. And I was like, done. And so um, I just went to college, destroyed it, graduated at 20. I was, I just turned 20 years old and I was done. Good like for you, man. That's and crazy. So, and that's 20 years old, you're done college. What happened next? Well, now for the first time in my life, I had 24 hours a day I could work. Yeah. Because I always was splitting my time between school and work. I and now, if you don't mind me asking, while you're in college, like how much were you roughly making per month? Because you had a lot of side hustle going on. Oh, yeah. No, I, the, the company was in, in the multi-millions by the time I finished school. Um, it was a very, very successful company by the time I left school. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, as soon as I graduated, I got the most expensive office place in Arizona. Um, and said, we're going to go legit now. I'm going to hire an in-person team uh, to, to help the 80 people that I had by that time offshore. Yeah. Uh, I said, I want the biggest deals, the biggest clients. And uh, one day I was looking up, I was 20 years old. I started working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I had the nicest office place in all of Arizona. And I look up, um, like, what's my plan here? I was like, do I want to sell this company? What's up? And so I looked up that service companies are very hard to sell. They don't sell fire high multiple. So I was like, well, wait a second, I'm a programmer. Why can't we productize uh, some of our service offerings, build a platform around it? So what I, would, what I did, it took me six months to do it, but I, I went back to our biggest clients and I said, hey, here's the deal. Uh, you're paying us 50,000 a month to manage all this stuff. I'm gonna take, you're gonna pay me the same, but 25,000 a month is gonna go for our platform fee. And then 25,000 is our managed service fee on top of it. They're like, cool. So now I started to build subscription revenue so that even if they didn't want us to manage it anymore, they still had to have access to our platform. Yeah. And that enabled me to eventually piece apart my business and sell it two and a half years later. What um, kind of multiple? So we'll talk about that for a second, because I, I think a lot of people might not understand what you just did by doing that there. Yeah, that was, um, uh, that was some, some uh, strategic engineering that was uh, on the business side. Uh, that I, I, I really don't know how I did it at that time. I understand it now. But yeah. Uh, I was my back against, against the wall and it's like, I got to solve this. And so what I did is you go from a one to 1. 1.5 multiple to mm -hmm. a five multiple without a problem up to a 10 times multiple because you're, you've now got platform, you've got um, three year contracts, you've got a managed service layer that's profitable on top of it. Um, and I never raised outside money. I started with a hundred bucks when I was 13. Dude, that's um, sick. Kept rolling every single dollar I made right back in. Um, and so the multiple, we went from, let's say, getting hypothetically a 1 to 1 1.5 to 2 to 3 times that be simply by changing the structure, the business model, simply by changing that. Same revenue. Same revenue, same everything. That's crazy. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Smart. So smart. 
Well, for private equity, you know, private equity firms do this all the time. They'll come in and they'll take a public company private or they'll take a company that's struggling. They'll restructure the way it's modeled. Um, they're doing a lot in software too, is they build the three-dimensional pricing model. Um, and just by changing the model, you now move into a different category. Mm-hmm. Um, with Snow, I'm doing it again with Snow. Snow is like, Snow started off as a teeth whitening company. Now yeah. it's, and Snow is, is a, a beauty technology platform. And mm. so focus on the oral care market, which is the $80 billion market. We've invented the premium oral care sector online. And we own that sector by far. Um, and now it's like, I, we get 10 million people coming, uh, seeing our ads every single month online. I want 100 million uh, every single month seeing our ads. So what does that look like? And so for us, we play, Snow plays in the beauty space, oral care space, technology space because of our software platform, pharmaceutical space because we, we, um, we generate first party data. When's this IPO coming out? I want in. <laughs> it's coming. And it's, and, you know, we're, what we've done is what I did is I, I read every case study I could from Harvard Business Review, $8 at a time. And yeah. I'm, re, I'm tearing through them. And I focused on M&A because I wanted to, when I was in college, I thought of switching my major to finance because I wanted to get into M&A and private equity. Um, but I, I realized that I, I don't want to do that yet. I wanted to build the companies. I like to build the brands myself and uh, felt like I was way too young to go in that anyway. But so what I realized is that pharmaceutical companies sell for incredibly high multiples. Beauty companies have high margins, sell for high multiples, especially when they're branded. Um, and then oral care, obviously being an $80 billion market with huge companies that own it with huge checkbooks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, what I've done, and then you've got software companies um, that obviously sell for high multiples. So what I've done is I com- I've combined the worlds. I- I've been selling beauty products for 10 years <clears throat> and I've been in technology for longer than that. I combined the two worlds I know the most and love the most into one company wrapped in a brand in a market that's deep and international mm-hmm. and then celebrities on top. Um, and I learned that from Warren Buffett. He says, buy commodities, sell brands. And you look at every business he's been in, it's a commodity it's insurance. He builds a brand around the get-go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly what we're doing is we're taking toothpaste that's a need to have. The only time you buy toothpaste is when you run out. That's right. You need to have and to a want to have. Well, guess what happens? When you have snow toothpaste in your in your house and you're shopping at Walmart or anywhere and you see a, a competing toothpaste, you're not gonna you're not gonna add it to your cart because you already have some at home that you actually like, tastes good. Yep. And by the way, Jennifer Lopez sold it to you. So you're like, you're emotionally connected to your toothpaste. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm drop what Dollar Shave Club did to Gillette, where they, if you have razors at home, you're not buying more razors. So what happens, I don't just win a customer. I own the customer. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. Will not go anywhere else. They will not buy any other products if they already have toothpaste, mouthwash, floss, toothbrush, refills coming. Their teeth are white because of snow. The refills are coming in. Are these all rebills? They're eventually going to be rebuilds, but gotcha. I, I didn't want to go. I, I took a big risk uh, from a business side of the strategy side. I said I could follow the dollar shave club model and that's solely disrupting the business model, which is great. Take a commodity, turn it into a subscription. It's mm-hmm. going to be at a low price. Great. Uh, they had a great exit, a billion dollars. That's cool. But um, I'm going for 10 billion, right? So for mm-hmm. me, it's like, uh, only solely innovating on the business model, the pricing model is not enough for me. I want to innovate first on the product itself, own the patents, own the trademarks, truly have a product that's Apple or Dyson level. Yeah. Produced a subscription side of things. There's a company called Simple Human and they make trash cans and trash bags. Yep. Incredible company. They innovated on the product, premium trash cans, and they have the subscription model with the trash bags. So we're doing the same model like Dyson does, like Simple Human, make the product truly the best, have celebrities love it, and if they want to pitch it, great. Then introduce a subscription model and then acquire data on the back end. So yeah. that um, you know, we, are, we are starting to issue insurance to our customers, uh, dental insurance. So Interesting. for us, we understand when people brush their teeth, um, you know, we will through our platform, right? We know when they whiten their teeth, how long they whiten their teeth, we know more about that person's mouth than the dentist. Mm-hmm. Um, dentists are our best friends. They love selling snow. Uh, they love selling our products. And they can one click, the user can one click upload their behavioral data to the dentist. So the dentist can understand right then and there what's causing them to have cavities. 
So you can Dude. understand on the back end, pharmaceutically, pharmaceutical size on the insurance side, when you're building out quantitative models to price insurance plans. Uh, this is what's useful. And my thing is we protect the customer. So we don't want to just harvest data and like, uh, you know, squeeze it out of the customer just to profit off of them. What we want to do is we want to build an ecosystem where all of a sudden it's like, hey, you know what? Your dental insurance is free because you brush every single day, twice a day. Um, we can see based on your MyFitnessPal, you eat pretty healthy. Your Fitbit data tells us you work out every day. You know what? $5 a month for insurance for you. Um, yeah. So wow. all of a sudden, if dental insurance is free, you only need one dental insurance plan. So yeah. I can take you away and say, hey, come over here. Dental insurance is free. Um, all of a sudden, I'm taking up you know, a, a multi-hundred billion dollar market across the, the sectors, and I'm able to take those people. But if you do it, if you do it, it's just uh, saying, we have cool dental insurance. The trick is it's toothpaste, toothbrushes, teeth whitening. It's a habitual product, mm -hmm. which you need the consumer to want to use it. And so when our toothbrush it utilizes carbon fiber and 24 karat gold, and it's the same price as Oral-B, all of a sudden you're like, um, Floyd Mayweather uses this gold toothbrush. I've got the app. I've got all this technology. It looks sexy. I got to use it every day. And it's the same price as Oral-B. Let me hop over here. Oh, yeah, get no brainer. So that's, that's the model. It's a longer game that we're going after. Yeah. But you know, oral care hasn't changed in 90 years. Dental insurance is old and decrepit. Pharmaceutical research on the dental side, there's a huge gaping hole. And time.com just came out and said they're linking, they've linked Alzheimer's disease to, um, dental, uh, to uh, dental disease. Uh, really? So an indicator of Alzheimer's, which is huge for the billions of dollars in Alzheimer's research. Yeah. Are going to have primary research available to the billions of dollars of funding out there for wow. Alzheimer's. So we can actually push modern healthcare forward through the mouth because the mouth is the check engine light for the gut, for the for a lot of diseases that happen in the organs. Yeah. Dude, the, the way you, the strategy you have wrapped around this is probably far exceeding I've ever seen any other e com store. That's fucking impressive. It's it's serious, man. What's it like being so smart? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucked up. Uh, <laughs> I got a separate question for you. Energy wise, do you do anything to keep your energy up? Because I got a good feeling that you maintain it pretty well throughout the day. You know what, Matt? So, you know, every day I wake up uh, and I'm I, I I work till three in the morning. And you know, my thing is once I get going, I get going. Like I don't need drugs. I don't need coffee. I don't do any nootropics. Nothing, I huh? Nothing. I, I like coffee. I like the taste of it. It doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, I, I like the taste of it. Plus, uh, coffee is coffee is great for us because it stains people's teeth. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Spaniard, so I love wine. Also, yeah, yeah. yeah, I love diet soda. I know it's not good for me, but I don't care. So, yeah. I, if you look across caffeine, I like to have a good time. But uh, for me, when I look at how little I feel, like a little peanut. Yeah, and that's how I feel. I wake up every day, and I'm still that kid on the city bus with a big dream and all the odds stacked against me. Every single day I wake up. I respect that, man. That's sick. I say, how, how am I going to earn my dinner today? And it, yeah. when you have a team and you've got a team as good as mine, you wake up and you say, these guys are looking at me saying, what Josh, show us the way. And we're right next to you. And we're going to help show you the way too. And like, you get this pressure when you've got LeBron on your team, you've got Michael Jordan on your team, you're in there waxing the floor yourself. You're yeah. in their balls up. You're in there shooting with them. You're watching tape all night. When you are obsessed about this, uh, the way that I am, uh, across our multiple brands, but Snow particularly because of the impact it has on a global scale. Yeah. For me, energy wise, it's reminding myself where I came from, reminding myself where I want to go. Yeah. Realizing there's someone else out there uh, with mouth watering trying to eat my lunch. And yeah. Every day. I, and there's only more coming. They're all coming. Oh, we shut down a copycat every two weeks. Um, yeah. I don't care. I said, we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to go and do what we have to do. You know, I may, our, our goal is eventually IPO. Um, yeah. Head down that path. Hey. If I've got to raise $5 billion to do that, to, to do what we need to do. If I got to raise 500 million um, in, on the way to an IPO, I don't care because I know what we're building and I know exactly what to do now. I've, 
a lot of people think Snow is my first, you know, business or it's our first success or it's our, our big, it's not even our biggest brand of revenue. Wise. So hmm. um, people think that that's the front runner. They think that, um, you know, my Bentleys, my Ferraris, my Lambos are from Snow. It's like, I've been doing this for a long time mm-hmm. and I smoke nothing and it's all in your mind. Like I, I wake up and I make my mind my bitch and I say, here's what you're going to do. And I control that. And yep. I get exhausted. I'm sure sometimes I need to just hang out by the pool. I need to go party. You know, I have, I, I'm, I'm friends with some of the best DJs in the world. And so I say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to fly to Miami. I'm going to hop in the DJ booth and we're going to, we're going to go crazy till 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Uh, but I, I realize I got one life to live. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to party hard. I'm going to outwork everybody. I out party everybody out, whatever it is, I'm going to outdo it to my best ability. Not because I want to show off, not because I'm competing with the people around me because internally, like I love every, everyone I'm with. I, I want everybody to win. Yeah. And yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. internally, it's like, I know, I, I, I think the happiness, especially with, with men, but in general, it's, where your perceived potential is, where you're at, and how fast you're getting there. Yeah. That's when crisis happen, etc. Men realize that their potential is it, that they're not getting to their potential fast enough. So there's this frustration, and then you get you know divorce rate. You get, like a lot of things happen in that that sector. Mm-hmm. So what I mean that is when you're someone that realizes that, um, and everybody can do this. You realize your potential keeps that bar keeps rising. And you're, you're moving fast, but that thing's moving fast too. Yeah. You're like, it's a race and it's, it's going now. Eventually you got to say, okay, like Bill Gates was like, cool. I'm the richest guy in the world. Now let me just give it all away. Let me chill a little bit. Like yeah. that point after a while, but why does Jeff Bezos push the way he pushes to make, to buy a Lambo? No, no, no he doesn't give it's in here. It's in yeah. here. When you say, what is it like to be smart? Um, it's, it's fucked up because it's never enough. And it's like yeah. in mind, you, you, you know, things that maybe some people don't see it the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not that you're special. It's purely because you've read more or you I was going to say, things. man, you're very well, like the stuff you're talking about doing the hard reviews, all that. Honestly, if there's a podcast, I hope people listen to twice. It's this one because there's so much strategy packed into this call. We haven't talked anything about tactics, yeah. but the strategy that you're going through, man, is what's going to build a real true business. Just a, you know, tactics make you rich, strategies make you wealthy. Yeah. And I always, I always like to analogize it where, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is the least selfish person in the world. If you run a small business right now, um, unless if that's what you want, you want a lifestyle business, you read the four hour work, be cool. Um, yeah. Not Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss, I love him to death. But um, that book in many ways has on one side, I give it so much credit because it's pushed so many people into taking risks and becoming an entrepreneur. On the other side, uh, and this is not his intentional. This is not his fault at all. Um, he's one of the most brilliant guys I follow. But I think on the other side, people have taken that and said, "Oh, I can have a laptop lifestyle, and I can just everything's easy." And this for me, and that's okay. I have nothing against that. Yeah. But I got to tell you, from doing this for twelve years, I lived that laptop lifestyle. I sold my company, and I I became depressed. Like I literally, for the first time in my life, I was upset depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I didn't know like, what I want. Like a man that just landed on the moon, right? You're like, look, I, you realize the pursuit is your happiness. There is no yeah, pursuit yeah. happiness. The pursuit is your happiness. Yeah. And the bigger I can, the bigger I can make my goal, the bigger market we can play in, the bigger competitors we can go after. I, I'm chasing away. I'm literally running from my own dep- depression in that way of like, I have to be doing a hundred things at a minute. I, and and I, all my mentors who I now have, who I'm very grateful for, are 80 years old, 75 years old. They wake up and they're re- like, everywhere you go, everywhere you see me, I've got the, the newest Harvard Business Review here talking about the brain science behind business. This is neuroscience and marketing. Like I'm reading this, you know, I'm, I'm reading, you know, Simon Sinek, one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite books, Leaders Eat Last. Nice. I'm reading this and then. Do you then, like Sinek? Oh, I think he's great. I think he's incredibly intelligent. Yeah. I'm reading. 1500 ways to reward employees. Nice. nice. When I go to a restroom, it's easy to read. So I'm yeah. thinking, like, how can I reward my employees? Keep everybody on the same page. Then I'm reading this, right? How to win, how to argue and win every single time. Nice. And, and then when I'm feeling down, I read this Churchill on courage because you got to have courage. And these are just quotes 
Yeah. So I've, I've got short form. I've got kind of medium form. Um, and then I've got magazine style. Harvard, yeah. Uh, and then I've got two of longer form going on. And this is just one desk, right? This is just one office. Yeah. So everywhere I'm, <laughs> and when I'm driving, I'm listening. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hungry and becoming rich only made me more hungry. Like it, yeah. I, I was going to becoming a millionaire. I was like, Oh, if I'm a millionaire, I'm set. I don't have to do anything. What happens is it fucks you up. If you're smart, like if you, if you catch it, it fucks you up, especially the younger you do it because then you're like, shit, like, well, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And you're like, I have to do huge things. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm sick and I am depressed and I realize it's like the Lambo is cool. Like I love driving my cars. But I will sell all of them right now. Take them from me. Take my, take my watch. Take yeah. my literally take everything from me. If if I had to choose between having something, a purpose, and a team, I love my team. I love being a leader in my team. If you had to take that away, I take all of my stuff away. Take it all. I don't care. Yeah. I I need need this purpose. I love uh, that, bro. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to touch on drive. Go I ahead, want to get. touch on something that you were saying, man. Because you say every morning you make your mind your bitch. Do you have any tactics for that? Because that's huge, and I don't think people really realize like how powerful that is. You know, I um, so I'm like the the uh, you know I'm not into a lot of the gurus in the sense of like uh, the make money online gurus and that type yeah. of stuff. I think that information in general should be free. Um, yeah. You know, for me, look at where I learned. Public library free. Google, yeah. free. YouTube, free. The, um, the distillation and fragmentation of knowledge and, and, and the printing press, you look at what the printing press did to modern day society and moving us through the industrial age to the information age. Like you look at those, those catalysts to human thought and it's always been free knowledge. The, the uh, decentralization of knowledge mm -hmm. has always led to human advancement. Uh, yeah. The internet was the number one thing in the last 30, 40 years is put us, look, we're talking, I don't know where you guys are at and we're yeah. real conversation that we're going to share with thousands of people. Mm -hmm. All different parts of the continent. Yeah. The one thing is I, I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins. Mm. Uh, particularly, you only got to go to one of his events and you can capture it all there. Uh, unleash the power within. And he gives some pretty good tactics. You can read a book. So it's $5 on Amazon. Read the book and it talks about um, and he's just one of them that I follow for the mind stuff. But ultimately it comes down to this. Uh, uh, there's a book called like the four second rule. I, I forget the dates of all the books I read, but um, like, oh, I'm, I need to brush my teeth. Four seconds, just go do it. Like yeah. you go to the gym, just you're half asleep. Just get in the car. Don't crash. And just like, or put the gym in your freaking bedroom if you have to. Yeah. Clothes. Like I try to use as many of the factors in my way to, to make my head which is the elephant. You got the elephant in your head, which yeah. is like, let's just watch a movie. Uh, let's just go to sleep. I'm tired. As soon as I start to give up uh, or I feel like I'm giving up on the day or giving up on a task, I give in. So I've, I've trained my mind where, um, like for example, I watch um, a lot of um, movies on athletes, uh, documentaries on athletes. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, who we work with, a phenomenal example of this. When he is running, and he wants to give up, his body aches, and he's in pain, he runs faster. So instead of giving up, you give in. And what happens is you mentally break those limit, the limiting beliefs. You physically tear that muscle so it's stronger the next time. Yeah. And mind is a muscle the same way. When I'm like, I wake up in the morning, and I say, I want lawsuits. I want people, I want more competition. I wake up, and I think of the worst things in my mind so mm -hmm. that expand my mind. I'm like, I, what would happen tomorrow if we go out of business and like, what would happen if an employee stealing from me right now? And I yeah. put the, the craziest stuff in my head so that I can control my mind. And, uh, there's a, there, this, uh, actually th this, uh, magazine I'm reading, it just came out. They talk about, um, the default network. So th there are four networks in your mind. Um, well, it's up to 15, but four that they talk about that operate in your mind at one time. The default network is, um, when you are dazing off, when you're daydreaming, what happens is people are too busy because of social media, ping, 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 ping. They, uh, they're zombies now, which is, which is sad, but it's great for marketers because you can yep. use buyer products. It's great for you if your competitor is a zombie. But for me, 
I realized that I have to let my mind go into the default network because that's where all innovation happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and default network is simply you literally sitting there. Um, transcendence happens in this neural network where you're sitting here and you're thinking, what is it going to be like when I IPO? How does the bell sound? Um, you know, who's going to be up there with me? Um, so you're kind of vision boarding. Then you're also thinking about what happens tomorrow if they don't want to do the deal or if they do do the deal, but they want to pay net 90 instead of net 60. What's that going to look like? Um, what does our product line look like two years from now? What team do I need to do that? So many people are in the go, 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 go. And then let me watch a Netflix documentary. My brain's dead. And then let me take a nap. And that's it. Like people are in zombie mode. Yeah. I be in that default network as much as possible. When you're in that default network, um, what, what this article found out or is explaining is that our body, uh, our mind is processing whether we're actively thinking or not. So whenever we're watching TV, what that means is that the more that you read, the more that you listen to, the more you consume, even if you're not paying full attention to it, your mind is processing it down the line. That's where ideals come from. That's where problem solving. That's why when you sleep, Interesting. you're humming in the background solving problems. So yeah. I try to feed as much as I can into this big head of mine and, uh, and feed it all in. And then I put a cap on so none of it spills out. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> I, I always see you wearing a hat, man. <laughs> smooth, you know? Yeah, everybody thinks I'm bald. Yeah. <laughs> this cap on so I keep all, all that in there. And uh, the, way, the tactics for making your mind a bitch is essentially to say, I'm in control of my mind. My mind controls my body. My mind controls my emotions. This is no, I don't do yoga. I don't meditate. I don't drink tea. Uh, all I do is wake up and say, what I want to get done today? Where am I at? And I'm 100% in charge of that. Nobody owes me anything. Uh, I've got to do it. And my mind is my computer. It's a supercomputer. Mm-hmm. And so I program the right applications. I've got to download the right apps on my, pro, on my machine so that it runs smoother. I got to delete things from here so it's not cluttered so the system operates better i've got to get rid of negative energy friends that around me that are negative that are jealous because they're corrupting they're like malware in my yeah yeah if you're right like a computer you're fully in charge of it and realize that people all every billionaire every successful person whatever you want if you want to be a billionaire i don't care what i am i don't care if i'm poor all i want to do is create amazing brands amazing companies work with great entrepreneurs and hopefully live as long as i can that's all i care about yeah. And you, if you start with that framework of abundance, all of a sudden your brain starts to like think so much beyond that. But then you have to layer that with practicality. I think that's where, you know, my dad is, um, you know, my dad was studying quantum physics when I was a kid. He would have me articles on quantum physics. I didn't even know what I was reading. And he works at the post office, right? Yeah. The nice thing was about this in US or Spain? US. Okay. He currently still works at the post office. He loves his job. Nice. And, uh, and so he's, when he's in the post office, he takes a break. Guess what he has access to? He has access to all the scientific journals that professors are getting before they get it. Nice. Mm-hmm. Information for free. And I didn't get this until a couple of years ago. Yeah. Like, not so smart. And how is he so relevant? Because he's got free access to journals and you only have to pay 4000 a year to get. And even then, you still have to be a doctor to get them. He's over here seeing the articles that he's passing them through and he's looking at them. Opens, flips a little bit. Oh, interesting. So he's able to see the stuff before the doctors see it. So for me, I'm trying to constantly download all that I can on my system. And at the end of the day, you say, my mind is, just tell yourself, my mind is my bitch. I can, I can do whatever I want it to do. I just got to program my brain to do it. And then you've got to get over that inertia because it's like you're laying on the couch and you're like, I should probably go to the gym. I should probably go to the gym. I should probably do it. In life, you end up with two, one of two things. Regret. Or discipline. Yeah. Regret yeah. sucks. Yeah. It, it hurts. It leads to depression. Nobody wants to die with a pile full of regret. Discipline, on the other hand, squashes down the regret. And discipline is what creates brands. It's what creates um, uh, character. It's what creates great bodies. It's what creates great minds. Discipline, discipline, discipline. And you know, some of the best leaders, business leaders I know, were ex-military. Yeah. Yeah. Best employees too. Best employees. They learn discipline and discipline is sisters with grit. And if you've got grit and you've got the discipline to put the hat to persist in those adverse, adverse times, you will win every single time. I don't care if you're the dumbest rock on earth, you will still win uh, because people give up too quickly. Yep. 
Very true. Dude, I freaking love it, man. Talk about these brands now. So you sold your other company, right? Did you get right into building your own brands right away or how'd that transition look? Well, we started, um, we started building the side projects, you know, seven years ago when we would like lose a client and um, I didn't want to fire anybody. So I was like, if we can have like affiliate sites or blogs, like I've been affiliate marketing for 12 years. So I'm like, if we can have affiliate marketing, uh, AdSense sites back in the day, it was like, we could have little things on the side. They would have stuff to work on in between clients and they would have full creative control over it. They, they felt like they could do whatever they want on it. And I let them do whatever they wanted. So it was like our sandbox. The sandbox started to do really well. Um, and that's where it made sense for us to sell the business because we had those side projects doing well. Nice. Uh, but when I, when I exited the company, um, you know, the main company, I, I got depressed because I was working 16 hours a day. I was on calls all the time, closing deals. I love to close deals. I love to sell. Um, and I, I had nothing to do. So for six months, I was like, okay, I got to create a list. Cause I've got, as a marketer, especially you have a thousand opportunities coming at your desk daily. Oh, yeah. I, sell it. I could sell that. Oh, I see the market in this big market. There's a thousand billion dollar markets. Like there's a million of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oral care is one of a thousand things that you could do. Uh, and so for me, it was like, what do I like? I was like, I've been, I've been whitening my teeth since I was 13 years old. Um, and, you know, I, I've had braces multiple times. I had jaw surgery. They took my jaw out of my head. Um, I'm friends with dentists. I'm friends with oral surgeons. Uh, and I just started doing research. I was like, I need something that literally is, uh, is a 50 year opportunity. Like I need to do something for 50 years and it has to be a massive market where if I own 1% of the market, it's a billion dollar market cap company or something like that. Yeah. That's where I made that checklist. It was like, can I do this for 30 years? Um, can I tell everybody at the party about what I do? Can I be proud of what I'm doing? Um, will it actually impact society long-term? Um, will I make enough money so I can give it all away before I die and actually have some impact? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm making this whole list. Can I work with smart people? Um, uh, you know, scientists, doctors, surgeons, uh, all that. So I'm like checking it. Is it a beauty? I love beauty products. I love high-end premium design. Um, does there technology involved? That's a huge advantage I have. So I'm like, I made this checklist and all of a sudden, like only 1% of opportunities coming across my desk made sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's where uh, if I prioritize that list of what I wanted out of my life and that helped me filter through the opportunities coming across my desk. And that's Dude. where I stumbled into snow and said, if I can make a million dollars with this really quickly, um, I know that I'm onto something. But I was like, we have to make something that's truly unique. So our, our formula, nobody's got it. I don't care what they say. Nobody's got our formula. That's why it's the best. Our technology, nobody's got it. The fact that you can plug it into a phone, people either license that stuff or they rip it off from us. Nobody, the, the origin of innovation uh, is what our plan is to always be. We mm -hmm. want to be the origin of innovation and, let the and give the copycats content to, feed, to, to make the scraps out of. I'm yeah. fine. But now, we're, now I'm going to go into an aggressive mode. We're, we're starting to acquire patents. And we're just going to, I'll raise $500 million to shut everybody else down. Yeah, uh, I like it. My thing is, if we got the best product, we we know we can service the customers better than anyone else. We deserve to uh, own the market. And we mm -hmm. want to hurt our right there. And in terms of uh, on the patent stuff is um, patents, generally I'm against patents. But when it's something that we're, we're original. What's the reasoning behind that? What's that? What's the reasoning behind that? Well, I think that they can uh, patent trolls and like people that simply squat on a patent. It's like squatting on a domain name. Yeah. And they're going to charge a million dollars for like, dude, you're, you're suppressing innovation and entrepreneurship. That's what this country is built off of. Yeah. And using that patents, unless you're using them, you're suppressing them. So I want to buy them from people who are just sitting on them. And uh, I want gotcha. to use them. And I want to create yeah. them products because of that. Yeah. Gotcha. Question for you in that first million, um, what was like the turning point where you realized, cause you said you wanted to make a quick mill, see, see if the, that, the, uh, snow had legs at what point in that million did you decide like, Oh wow, we're onto something. This is going to be huge. Well, you know, it comes really, really the real, real answer. And, and everybody likes to get likely correct answers. Like there was just this moment and really for me, it was into, there's a lot of intuition into this, right? It's like, yeah, this is the 12 year overnight success story. Yeah, uh, and we're still a peanut compared to what we're going to become. But um, 
for me, it was intuition. I just, uh, my mentors always tell me, follow the money. Uh, you know, somebody's making money. I don't care if you like it or not, follow the money. You mm-hmm. can all make it something you like later on. Sales cures all. So for me, it was like, follow the money. Intu- uh, intuitively, I felt that this was an area where we could bring superior technology, superior design. I could bring superior celebrities and market and advertise better than anyone else um, and, and make toothpaste taste good and make it fun. Like, I started to feel that and intuition. Now, some people listening might be like, well, I don't have intuition like that. Intuition is the highest form of intelligence, right? Intelligence is driven by wisdom. Wisdom mm-hmm. is by experience, your own experience, but also other people's experience, mostly other people's experience, whether you know it or not. Other people's experience comes from where? Watch, listening to podcasts, mm-hmm. watching videos, reading books, talking to smart people, talking to people that disagree with you. I love finding people that disagree with me. I love having debates. Mm-hmm. That's where you get experience, which leads to wisdom, which leads to intelligence, which used over and over again, especially when you focus, which is the key to success, leads to intuition. Mm-hmm. That's why you have people like Warren Buffett who can smell, literally can smell a stock that's going to pop off. Like he can yeah. smell three years yeah. ahead of him. If you ask Warren Buffett, what's your secret? You know, uh, he's going to tell you at the end of the day, it's the fact that he's read 8,000 book, uh, freaking reports. Like that's, it's the, it's the, uh, uh, there's a word in here and I have to get it. Uh, one second. It's when you, you're reading, uh, yeah, empiricism. So empiricism, uh, empiricism is the sum of all your knowledge, sum of all your experiences. Empiricism is what is the driver behind intuition. So you've got to be doing stuff. But here's the thing, you got 24 hours a day, you can't do everything. So I'm trying to learn from other people that are doing it, what, what they're doing, what's working, what's not working. And then in my own mind, I try to never lose that childhood imagination where in my mind, I'm going to those places in my mind and I'm going to those scenarios so I can learn from it in my own head and then bring that back and say, here are the five scenarios that might work. I think this is the best one. Yeah. That's, Warren Buffett does that in a split second and it all happens inside of his brain. Yeah. So the thing is, anyone can do this. Like you don't have to be smart. Be like, like it, IQ wise, you, all you need to do is swallow up what's out there and use it to your advantage. People don't read enough. They don't think enough. They don't sit in quiet and silence enough. They spent waste too much time on, on consuming, making yeah. up rich, uh, uh, Netflix. How much are you getting paid for watching all those Netflix movies? Nothing. How much is it for scrolling for five hours a day? Nothing. Yeah. Well, what the hell are you doing? I listen to audiobooks at three times speed, podcasts at two times speed, every YouTube video, unless it's deep, 1.5 to two times speed. I yeah. take, I'm constantly taking notes everywhere I go um, because I want, I want to write it down and remember it, think about it. I'm going back to the notes. I'm, going, I'm a I'm huge fan of pen and paper, man. Yeah. The best thing I ever invented. Yep. Yeah. 100%. Way more connection guys, than typing it out. Yeah. I got Romano, one of my guys on my team, he told me that. He's like, dude, I thought you're crazy walking around with pencil and paper. Now he does it too. He's like, I get it. Every mentor I know, and I know that they're older, they're 78 years old, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Every single mentor I know, they got iPhones. My 82 year old, my best friend, uh, we run our nonprofit program together um, for, for kids, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged kids in Arizona State. Um, nice. So he, he carries around a note, uh, pen and paper. Uh, my other buddy, literally in his little pocket, he had um, custom index cards made with his little company on top. And he's always got a stack of them and a pen on him at all times, pulls that thing out and he's writing things down. And he always, this is one thing that millennials don't understand the power of the follow-up. The follow-up is everything. When I meet somebody and I want to do a deal with somebody, you are going to, if I get your phone number, you're screwed because I'm going to send you every, every magazine that we're in. Every article, every podcast I'm in, I literally go ding, 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 ding. I'm continuing those conversations because guess what? Most of success comes down to timing. Yeah. It comes down to timing. It's opportunity and preparedness meet. So I got all prepared and the opportunity is based on the timing. So I'm I'm always prepared. I'm ready. And as soon as the deer is in my sight, I can shoot. Yeah. So I'm always working on that deer getting in my sight. And that's the follow-up. I'm following up. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm always thinking of other people. I said, how can, you know, what does Tyler need in his life right now? What is, what does Gabriel need right now? Okay. What, how can I line up those incentives and give, give value with expecting zero return, not some bullshit. 
right well, there. Now yeah. the situation where you're like, all right, uh, all right, I'll have coffee with this guy because then I can get a deal from him next week, or let me ask him for money, you know, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, not gonna happen. I Bro, you're you're the only dude that sent me like all of like your info, your newest products, like your previous podcast. Like you're the only person that I got to like heavy research before I got on a podcast with. And I, I truly enjoyed it. Like I listened to I listened to you in uh, James, and I was like, man, this guy's fucking awesome. I'm excited. I'm, for this. I'm busy as fuck, right? I'm I'm busy as fuck, and so when I hear excuses, I don't want to hear it because yeah. I'm the I'm the busiest person on, uh, that I know. Yeah, and I hope to stay that way forever until I die. Yeah. Uh, I'm the busiest person I know. If I could take time out of my day, no matter who you are, to sit there and think through what I want to cover on this podcast, let me make sure they have a holistic view so that they're prepared and they're taking advantage of the time. Uh, like if, if you could, if I can do this, anybody can do this. Yeah. Uh, take four hours away from the TV you're watching. Take four hours away from the random scrolling that you're doing. Uh, sleep one less hour a day. Listen to Elon Musk. He said the only way he got ahead in his life is he works two times as much. Listen to Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Kobe two a days, right? He's he's in there at 5 a.m. The team arrives at seven. He's already got two hours of practice done by the time everybody else practices. Bro. It, there is no freaking shortcut. There's none. Do you know, do you know Yermir Yager? Who's that? A uh, hockey player, like one of the best ever. Plays for the Florida Panthers. Buddy of mine does sells over there. So Yarmir will play a whole game, like a whole 60 minutes, right? And afterwards, after all the stands have left, the players left everything, he'll throw on an 80-pound vest and skate another 60 minutes on his own. Wow. And he's old, bro. That's, but that is right there. That's the mind of a champion. That's right. So, Keeps him in the game. Yeah. At 4 a.m. Or he, or he doesn't go to sleep. The guy, I've never seen him sleep. But the guy at 4 a.m. says – Who's this? Floyd Mayweather. Oh. He, he goes and points at the two drivers. He says, follow me. I'm going for a run. And he goes running, two Rolls Royces following, following him. And he's <laughs> running by himself, by himself. He's not impressing anybody. He is running until he can't run anymore. And there's a video on YouTube of him doing this. Really? And it's, it's him running at 3 a.m. in the morning in Las Vegas. Yeah. And he's in the street with his Rolls Royces following him. And it's by himself. And he's like, I'm just getting started. I could do this all day. I could run. Yeah. I could run forever. And you listen to those people. And whether you like Trump or not, whether you like Floyd Mayweather or not, whether you like Usain Bolt or not, whether you like Yarger or not, whoever it is, you cannot argue with the performance. The fact right. that Trump is in his head so much and he's like, I, you know what? I'm going to declare a national emergency so they can pay for the wall. I don't care. That type of thinking, crazy, right? It's like, yeah. from the, like the dude's nuts. But Elon Musk is like Hyperloop. It takes too long to go from San Francisco to San Diego or LA. Like, too long. Mars? Why aren't we living there? Like, that's the type of thinking. But you've got to back it up. And he didn't start thinking like that. He started thinking, wow, Zip2 or whatever the first companies he started. Oh, PayPal. Like, why can't we pay people a lot easier online? Like, yeah. you somewhere, it's like, oh, Snow, why can't people get results from the dentist in the comfort of their own home, but not have to do strips that are 20 years outdated and not have to have all these gimmicky lights and all this crap that's being sold online? Why can't yeah. you have actual, like, who's the Dyson? Of oral care. Why isn't there? I have the money. I want to spend fifteen dollars on toothpaste. Why can't yeah. why, let, me, let me spend fifteen dollars? Where is it? So I'm like, someone's got to create it. That's so right. That's what Steve Jobs realized. Elon Musk. All these guys realize that, and that's what that's what drives them. It's a drive inside. Like you just yeah. mentioned, player. If you've got that in your head, Usain Bolt is not looking left and right and say, "Who's next to me? I got to beat this guy." He's looking inside. Yeah. And true champions look inside. And it's the scariest place to live because you know that your potential is much higher. And you're, what like, you're doing. And then you look around, like when I graduated in two years, um, you know, I look, I didn't look around like you're graduating four, I'll do it in three. I'll do it. It's like, how fast can I graduate so I can work on my business 24 seven? Yeah. In two years. Nice. I walked out of my last class. Nobody was on campus. It was a summer class. Last class I walk out and you, in my mind, I was like, you know, kind of play. I'm like, imagine I walk out. There's like a parade. I'm like, you did it. Like, no one, no text messages from anybody. No yeah. one saying congrats. Nothing. I literally went and had like a, a Starbucks drink or something by myself. It was like, phew. All right. Done. What's next? Yeah. Like, that Man, that's, that's sick, bro. Dude, I want to ask you a couple questions because I do want to give people. First of all, this has been so jam packed, info wise. Yeah. It's fucking amazing. Huge. <laughs> 
Um, two things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, one, understand the growth of snow, like year over year, what that's looked like. Two, you, you're the only guy I've met with these types of influencers, A-listers. I want to hear about that and how you guys got those guys on board. So, uh, you know, our, uh, even though we we've, we've, uh, became a, a million dollar company, you know, very, very quickly, and now we're, we've become an eight-figure company very, very quickly, we've been profitable since day one, um, no outside funding, totally self-funded. Um, now, as we, like I said, we're peanut. Uh, toothpaste alone for us, it's a $27 billion market. So mm-hmm. for us, uh, you know, we want to own the premium oral care brand. We want to, we want to buy or push out anyone who's, who's not as good as us or is in our market. We own that market right now. We're going to continue to own that market. Like I said, if I have to raise $500 million to continue our, our momentum, I will, I don't care. Um, so for us, like the, the, the growth has been great and we've been putting every dollar right back into the company, but the celebrities, what happens is celebrities, we're in an interesting time because celebrities want to figure out how to monetize their social media uh, impact and their power. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them, you know, they get deals all day long, open a restaurant, do this, do that, do this. What I've realized is that uh, if I can create a brand that doesn't just suck off of the uh, celebrities pa- uh, influence and just sell a mediocre product, if I can create the world's best product that the celebrities actually want and need and they love it, it's going to give me a lot of leverage when I'm working with these guys. Mm-hmm. And so for us, if you look at how we design our products, how we market our products, it's very Hollywood friendly. Um, it's very sexy. It's, it's our new product looks like, you know, you want, you want to showcase it. You want to show it off. It's sexy. We've got a $10,000 teeth whitening kit coming out. It's dip. Um, we took one of our units, dipped it in pure gold and covered it in crystals. And nice. I think you sent me a picture of that. That's ten thousand dollars a unit, and we, wow. you know, whether you're the prince of Dubai or you're Madonna or you're a rich kid, whoever it is, if you want the best bath, or you want a statement piece to whiten your teeth with, boom, we're gonna do the same thing on the toothbrush. Like I want to put um, Floyd wants real diamonds on the toothbrush, right? So I'll put fifty thousand dollars of VVS diamonds on your toothbrush. So yeah. everything holding real diamonds and marble as you brush your teeth. So the brand positioning is. It's premium. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's to start with, um, because the truth is, you know, if Floyd Mayweather is brushing his teeth with one of our competitors, you're like, the guy's rich. He made two hundred eighty-five million in twenty seventeen in 30, 30 minutes. I mean, two hundred eighty million. The guy could buy just about anything. He's probably realistically not using this unknown startup with a crappy little product. There's no way. So you have to make sure that your product is something that celebrities would actually use. That's mm. Um, so that's, that's from the brand positioning, packaging, product development side from the start. Mm-hmm. Then it's like, okay, how do we create this aura of celebrity around it? And so for us, it's like, how do we get, uh, you know, D-listers, C-listers to at least start using it, reaching out to them, say, Hey, you want to try our product? Here's what we got. And then thinking through, um, the reason why we went after men, uh, big men, A-listers is I saw that the tw- only 20% of the buyers of teeth whining products are men. If I could, if I could go, if you're in eleven billion dollar, ten, call it a ten billion dollar market for teeth whitening, and only twenty percent of the market of those buyers, so two billion of that is uh, are male. If I could get thirty percent of the market, just ten percent uplift, to become teeth whitening buyers, uh, that's a billion dollars in new money that's realized in that market value in that in that market, and I can own that. Which means, mm-hmm. the truth is, what we've done is we made teeth whitening cool to gift. Like guys are hitting me up saying, Hey, you got a special guy. My girl wants it for Valentine's day. She wants it for Christmas. My daughter wants, she literally her graduation present. She wants a snow teeth whining kit. Wow. And like, I get those text messages from hundreds of people and, and wow. from strangers on our Facebook ads. I realized that if you gave strips to someone for Christmas or you gave to your wife for Valentine's day, you give her a box of strips from Walmart. She's like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> it's, almost, it's an insult. It's an insult. It's like buying someone toilet paper. Like what the yeah. hell? Is this? Yeah. They'll snow and they'll cry. Like they cry. We have videos of customers legitimately crying. Wow. Wanting the product for so long, but the price was just a little bit above of what they felt like they could afford. And yeah. They, it, they cherish it. They don't want to throw away our packaging. People resell our packaging on eBay. Weird. So like that. that Are you is, serious? Oh yeah. Etsy, uh, OfferUp, and eBay. They're selling our travel bags because they're. They're velvet, 
their hand, you know, handmade velvet. Uh, we were wow. doing hand stitch embroidered bags. This is free. It comes with the mm-hmm. kit. They were reselling it for fifteen dollars. They still are on eBay everywhere, and that was an indicator for us. We're like, okay. Then the next step with celebrities is, you say, okay, how can I include this celebrity legitimately in the brand? So, so instead of just hawking a product. What does Floyd and Floyd, you know, when, I, when we talk to Floyd and his team, it's like, as long as people have teeth, they're going to be buying our products. We are the next Crescent Colgate on the premium level where the social mm-hmm. media, we're taking advantage of it. And from a royalty perspective, if someone buys a toothpaste every single month and you're getting a piece of that Floyd for 50 years, you can pass down that generational wealth. And when we IPO and if you've got equity, you can pass that down. You can sell it, you give it to your kids. Um, and then if you include the managers in on some back end deals or you say, Hey, if this goes really well, I'll write you a $20,000 check to thank you for putting this deal together. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden, when I walk into a deal, I'm thinking, how does he make money? How does he make money? What are his insecurities? What does he need in his life? What does he want in his life? And what I found is that celebrities want something to talk about when they're at galas. They want to be able to be like, what are you up to now, Floyd? Oh, well, I've yeah. got stuff going on. I'm not fighting right now, but I've got one company uh, called Snow. You know, we're taking over the oral care market and I'm actually a partner in it. Like, wow, I've seen that everywhere. Mm-hmm. So that the marketing we do is high end, it's premium. The products are high end premium. We're attracting Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Saks, high end retailers. And then saying, Floyd, we're coming out with a champagne mouthwash and that Floyd's, that Floyd's going to be a part of. And it's, it's like, it's perfect. Champagne, it's gold. It's the best of the best glass bottle premium, um, getting them in the product and making them a part of the brand from the product development standpoint Mm -hmm. That is where it becomes interesting. And they feel, they truly feel, and they are a part of the brand versus another endorsement deal. That's why if you look at Rob Gronkowski, that, uh, he just posted yesterday, our music video, it's got close to a million views on it on Instagram organically. And it's him doing a vanilla ice remake of Ice Ice Baby and it's snow, tea, whitening. Damn. What I'm thinking through is, it's, it's on his Instagram right now. And what I'm thinking through is, what is Gronk's brand? He's funny. He's dorky. Um, he likes to dance. So when we're creating campaigns, we're making them friendly and they uplift the brand of the celebrity versus saying, hey, I want you to say this. And he's like, I don't want to say that. That's weird. Or like, yeah. I want so for us, we went after the manliest men, Rob Gronkowski, Chuck Down, Floyd Mayweather. Guess what? They all use mouthpieces to make their money. They yeah, all, yeah. They all play. This mouthpiece happens to whiten your teeth, which helps you look more attractive, date hotter women, make more money in your career, close more deals as a sales guy. Then all of a sudden, men are like, snow's tight. Like, I want to use snow. Yeah. If you have another product, though, that's weird. Like, if, it, if a guy's posting with strips or another product, mm-hmm. you're like, Oh, you got the knockoff or, Oh, you got the cheap version. Yeah. Oh, no, it's like, Oh, that's the stuff that Floyd uses. That's tight. So Damn. own cool in a market that's commoditized. Mm-hmm. That's very difficult for big companies to become cool. They have to mm-hmm. buy into cool. Crazy. When are you dropping yeah. gold, uh, mouth guards? Yeah, we got, well, we already have the gold. Uh, we have one in the office. Uh, oh, I meant like actual, like sports mouth guards. I was, well, one of the things I'm working on to deal with is, is um, figuring out um, and still in the early talks of it, but what I'm really good at in, in terms of deals, I think is, uh, is finding new money, newfound money. Yeah. So the UFC doesn't have is they don't have sponsorships on their mouthpieces like globally. Right. Oh. Uh, why not have a blue mouthpiece that everybody fights with that has a snowflake on it. And it's made by the, they have, I think there's too many factors that are approved to, to make those mouth guards. We'll use the same manufacturer. Everything's approved. Everything's good. It's just snow blue colored with the snow um, logo on it. So every fighter, no matter who you are, is starting off the fight with a snow mouthpiece. Yeah. So that's something that we want to do. And then the mouthwash and toothpaste is launching later this year. Um, and we're putting it in retailers. Um, and obviously signed direct to consumer, a subscription model. Damn. Interesting. Dude, that's sick. Uh, separate question that just popped in my head, man. When it comes to business, what do you think your top three skills are where you get your leverage from? Well, the first one is I'm, uh, I think I'm relentless. Uh, you know, I, relentless and fearlessness, I think go kind of hand in hand. They're powerful when combined. Hmm. I, I don't care, right? In terms of like, I care about the business, but I don't care about like failing. I don't care about looking stupid. Uh, 
I don't care about approaching big celebrities. I'm the least, I'm probably like the least uh, starstruck person on earth. Like you can yeah. literally be the president, you can be like a Victoria's Secret supermodel and I'm gonna, I'm gonna dress how I'm gonna dress, I'm gonna talk to you how I'm gonna talk to you. And, I'm gonna, and I'm, the other thing is, I'm always thinking about how can everybody benefit from a deal that we're doing. So I'm always thinking about what's in it for everybody at the table. Mm -hmm. I would say the third thing uh, that, that I'm pretty good at that goes with the fearlessness, relentlessness probably is, um, I'm an, I love to call out elephants in the room. So it's like, hey, here's the elephant in the room. How much does this cost? Like I, or I say, here's, the, here's an elephant in the room. I need to understand how you make money. Don't be afraid to tell me the percentage that you're going to make on this deal mm -hmm. because I want to make more than that. So talk to me. Like let, if you don't communicate with me, I can't help you make more money because here's the deal. Yeah. If I do a deal with five people, I've got me, uh, my company's involved, the agents involved, the lawyers involved, the celebrities involved, and the retailers involved. If I know how everybody makes money, I can reverse engineer a deal that's going to make everybody a lot of money with little work. That's the key. If I can do that on repeat, guess what they do? The agents come to me now. They're like, Josh, what do you have next? What's coming out next? Yeah. They're like, Josh, can you create something like this? That would be good. Josh, what's next? Because you get everybody aligned with what they actually want and need in their life. Yeah. And you provide that um, without asking an attorney. You just do it over and over and over again. People are like, Josh is no bullshit. He'll call you out, but it's not because he's being a dick. It's because he wants everything on the table so everybody can win. Mm -hmm. He's fearless. He will get it done. My team loves that because they know if there's a problem they can't solve, come to my office. We will solve it together. Like I don't care who I have to call. We will get it done. So that kind of like fearlessness at the top, um, the ability to think of other people and make sure everybody's winning in a deal, and then the ability to call out those awkward elephants in the room and address them head on, it makes people want to do business with you. And it makes the people that are shady and that are scammers or whatever, they don't want to do business with you. Because mm -hmm. right away, fuck, I can fuck everybody else over. This guy, I can't fuck over, right? Yeah. It's like, like it, and I tell people that, I said, look, I, I love your ideas. I love the way you've priced this out. And I want to help you make that money on other deals. I will literally come in there with your polo shirt on and I will help you make the money from other people. But that's yeah. not wrong here. And here's what will fly though. And here's what will make us more money in the long term if you're willing to play with me. If it makes sense, it makes sense. If it doesn't, abundant mindset, we will do business together. If it's not today, we'll do business in five years, two years, one year. As long as I don't get hit by a bus, Hopefully I've got 50 years to live. We're yeah. going to be together eventually. This timing is just a little bit off. Um, and if you, if you guys that, fine. That's why I never lose a deal because the deal will always come back to the table. Even if I have to bring it to the table. Yeah. Sick, bro. I love it. Dude. Man. Yeah. But I, got, I got one more dude. Of course uh, you do. I feel like Tyler's the question guy. He can like ask questions for like, no, I, I really I genuinely enjoy your mind, man. The oh, way for sure. I, I enjoy it too, man. I enjoy it too. But I want to give new people something, a tidbit, because I think a lot of the shit you talked about, maybe someone new can't really start with. So if you had one t tidbit for new people, what would it be? So this is, um, this is what I recommend. You got to get something that pays your bills. So if that means consulting, right, there are a million businesses. All you got to know is a little bit more than the business to be able to charge them to do it for them. Now yeah. you've got to deliver, and ideally you over deliver because you'll go out of business very quickly, building a bad reputation, not delivering. Um, don't be afraid to charge more if you're willing to buck up and, and, and create a better service. So, so if you're at a job right now, you're working a job and you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to do something, you feel that calling there, but you're just not sure where to start. Clarity comes from action. Um, it doesn't come from uh, inaction. Clarity only comes from progress. So you have to do something in order for you to get clear. You will never, ever be clear sitting on the sidelines. You will never, you will never. Uh, and so you have to get in the game. The way you get in the game is you have to replace your income so that you can pay your, your, your bills, your house, your food, Maslow's hierarchy. If you're a top sales guy right now in your organization or you're making good money, you're making six figures in your job right now, well, I got, I got a rude awakening for you. You got to dial back your living. You got to cut your living in half. Don't go out to eat every day. Um, don't, don't live in the nicest condo in town. Live in an apartment somewhere else. Uh, you know, if you've, got, if you've got kids and you're willing to take them out of private school for a year or two in order for daddy to build something where you can own the private school, 
Like whatever you got to do, you've got to get your wife on board, your closest people on board, your kids on board, communicate with them, make them a part of what you're doing. Don't let it just sit in your head and start making money. And the best way to do that is through services, selling your time at a higher price. You're selling your time right now on a job, sell your time at a higher price um, so that you can, so that you don't have to work at that job anymore. If you're already in your entrepreneurship business, you've already started something. What I want you to do is I want you to think a lot bigger than you're thinking right now. I want you to think a lot more long-term than you're thinking right now and say, okay, um, how can I think of points of distribution? Uh, that's the number one key to getting rich, especially in a physical products business, any business actually. If you're a software programmer and you're making software apps, how can you make it uh, applicable to Shopify on the apps ecosystem? How can you be Salesforce app? Take advantage of existing networks as a mm. trying to create a network or trying to create your own thing over here. Jump on what's already hot and create your market and your customers from there. Um, and then if you're already making a lot of money and you run a business and you're making your business making a million dollars a year, think a hundred times bigger. How can you vertically, how can you move up the value chain, the food chain? So if you're drop shipping, stop it and take your winning product and start making it better based on feedback. Go out and get a loan from the bank. Go out and get an office. If you work from home, go out and get an office. Getting an office is one of the best things I ever did uh, because what happens is it forces you to all of a sudden think bigger. Um, hire people. Don't be cheap. Hire better people. Go on LinkedIn and reach out to the companies you admire and want to be like. See who helped them get there. Message them. Say, can I pay you for an hour of consulting? Do you know anyone who I could hire for this? Start hiring, moving to higher value work um, than trying to do everything yourself. Hire the best people you can find in your network and ask people for referrals. Leveling up your people will level up your brand and your business for the long term. Get it all. Because now all of a sudden, when, like, when I wake up, like we can't, uh, making a million dollars a month, like we'll go out of business. Like, we can't make a million dollars a month now. We have to make $10 million a month. Yeah. Because I've got the best people working for me and I pay them well. I've got office. I've got warehouse. We do all of our fulfillment in-house. Nice. All of our in-house. I spent three million dollars last year just on research and development. No, nope, not inventory enough. Just research and development because I've got the smartest engineers working for me. Um, I wake up in the morning. I'm like, we've got to make two hundred thousand dollars to three hundred thousand dollars today. And if we make any less than that, we'll go out of business. Yeah. So it causes you to level up, and it changes the dynamic of the exit. Listen, if you're a business, you want to run a laptop lifestyle. Lifestyle is totally fine. I have nothing against you. But if you're trying, if you're confusing yourself, and you want to be uh, you want to fly in private jets and you want to drive Lambos one day and you want to give billions to charity and you want to give your family financial freedom forever and all that stuff. You're, you're lying to yourself. If you're living the laptop lifestyle and doing that, it's not easy. Um, you know, I, I left my, my throne of being able to just sit back and do nothing to get back in and go in 16 hour days. Because yeah. there's no cut. So if you're making a lot of money and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm doing really well. Josh got some good tactics, but I'm kind of I'm comfortable. All growth happen, no growth happens in comfortability. You've True. got to become uncomfortable. So if you're not waking up and you're not struggling every day and you're not like fighting, the other thing is, last thing I'll say, is if you're growing a business and you have cash in the bank, you're robbing your business. Never have cash in the bank, ever. Every dollar you have, even the shirt, if you can yard sale all your clothes away, and go to work naked with a towel on, every dollar you have should be in that business beyond the money you have, which is why if you're, if you're averse to raising money, if you're averse to getting a bank loan, small business loan, again, you're robbing your business. One of the best ways to grow your business is using other people's stuff, other people's money, other people's influence, other people's network, other people's people, other mm -hmm. people's lives, other people is how you, you become incredibly wealthy and successful. It's the only way. It's the only way. Yes, there are self-funded bootstrap billionaire companies. I love them. Uh, and I've been self-funded always. I still am. Everything we have is self-funded. But if you want to build something huge, maybe you don't have to raise money. You can go and take a bank loan. You can like level up in anything that you're doing. That would be my, my main key is like level up, get uncomfortable, uh, focus. Number one key to success is focus. Doing a hundred things at once is not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. Doing a doing hundred things inside of one business is going to build brand equity over time. Yeah. That's possible. Do you want to build a village of one level little shops or do you want to build skyscrapers, right? That's how you build a city. You don't build a city building build huts. You build a yeah. village 
with huts. You build a city with skyscrapers, infrastructure, cars, jobs, opportunity, and, and all of that. That's the only way to build a city. Man, that's it right cool. there. We're done. We're Bro. done. <laughs> that is so good. Bro. If you had a mic, you should just drop it right now. <laughs> that's it. Dude. Man, I just want to say thank you because that, that was freaking awesome, bro. That was really good. Thank you really guys yeah. on that. All right. Thanks everyone for listening today. For everyone watching, please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube. And for everyone listening, give us a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.